Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have quite the crowd here today. This is fantastic. Thank you to our audience who's actually also catching us live on YouTube, on the DOH channel. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speakers here today who are here for a panel at the Department of Health Abu Dhabi stand at Arab Health 2022. My name is Noura Al-Saraj, and I am the Deputy MD of Weber Shandwick Abu Dhabi. And today's panel is going to be focused on superheroes. Yes, you heard that correctly, superheroes. We're also going to be zeroing in on what players across the UAE's healthcare provider ecosystem have to say and about what's in store for the sector's workforce moving forwards, knowing what they know now. Over the past few days, we've heard from executives from around the world about what the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us, but also about the opportunities that lay ahead today and in the future. So I believe everybody here can agree with me that the pandemic has absolutely changed the way that we live, but also about the way that we are delivering our services to communities. So when it comes to healthcare delivery and patient care, the question here is, how do we embrace a healthcare workforce that is future-proof for the health and safety of our communities, but also that of our business continuity? Now to help me answer that, I have, I'm joined today by five individuals from whose organizations have also played major roles when it comes to helping the UAE break many records when it comes to the management of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to please join, uh, join me in welping, welcoming our speakers today. We have Dr. Nasser Ammash, the Chief Executive Officer at Sheikh Shahboot Medical City. We have Dr. Marwan al kabi the Acting group, group Chief Operations Officer at Saha. James Sibley, the Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer at Mubadala Health. Hein Van Eck, Chief Strategy Officer at MediClinic Middle East, and Zaid Siksik, Chairman of the Reem Hospital. Now, just before we begin, I would like to ask each of our speakers, please, if you could provide a snapshot of your entity and the role that it plays in the UAE. Well, uh, thank you for having us uh, this afternoon. I'm Dr. Nasser Amash. I'm a professor of medicine and a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic since 1994, and I moved from the U.S. to lead the joint venture between Mayo and Saha at, at the onset of the pandemic. So what a start. So I have, we have operated the facility since January of 2020. The goal is to transform SSMC into the next Mayo Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And with that in mind, uh, we're building the team up uh, to provide the best care possible, the best service possible for the more complex patients with what we believe in is an integrated, multi-specialty practice supported by medical education, innovation, and research. It's a hallmark of what Mayo Clinic would look like in Abu Dhabi, inshallah. It's ambitious and sounds phenomenal. Dr. Marwan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Marwan al Kabi, Acting Group CEO at Saha. Saha is the biggest healthcare provider within the UAE, and we provide all level of cares to our community, starting with the primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. We do so in 14 hospitals and around 70 clinics, plus blood banks, EDs, and many other healthcare providing units. Uh, before or pre-pandemic, we only we were limited with our services provided to the community of Abu Dhabi. However, during the pandemic, we extended that level of care to all seven Emirates, and uh, we also uh, managed to introduce many innovation and uh, new ways of doing or providing healthcare during the pandemic, which uh, I think it added value to the whole response. Uh, James Sibley, I'm the Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer for Mubadala Health. Mabadala Health is a GCC healthcare services company. We provide healthcare to patients in Abu Dhabi, which is our headquarters and hometown, in Dubai, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We employ about 10,000 caregivers, and we have about 18, uh, 118 locations. We're sometimes more well known for some of the brands within our integrated network, such as Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, uh, HealthPoint, Danat Al Emirat, Health Plus, and Imperial College London Diabetes Center. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hein van Eck. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for MediClinic Middle East. Uh, MediClinic Middle East is part of MediClinic International, a London-listed uh, healthcare provider with three divisions, um, 74 hospitals, 12,000 <coughs> hospital beds, and we employ 34,000 people globally. Um, so we operate in Switzerland under the Hirschlanden brand, in South Africa under the MediClinic brand, and also here under the MediClinic brand, where we operate seven hospitals and 20 clinics, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Noura, for having us. My name is Zaid al Siksik. I'm uh, chairman of Freem Hospital. We're a relatively new hospital. We opened up in the pandemic, so we have a lot to talk about in terms of what we went through. Uh, we are a 220-bed facility focused on rehabilitation, both physical and mental rehabilitation, and uh, we are also focused on orthopedics. I've probably been in this health system now for about 22 years, so we've seen a lot of change and improvement in the health system, which I'd love to share with you today. Thank you. Well, now that we know who our superstars are for today, I'd like to talk about the healthcare superheroes um, that supported us during the pandemic, um, that continue to deliver care to us and our family and our friends. But before we get into that, I want to take everyone back a few years ago, a couple of years ago, to early 2020. It kind of feels like it was just yesterday. But let's rewind back to early 2020 when leaders everywhere had to take quick decisions with little to no information at hand. So in a sector such as yours where decisions are dependent on data and outcome analysis, how did each of you overcome that? Dr. Nasser? Well, with agility and being bold, uh, I remember very vividly because we just opened the facility on January 9th, 2020, and then we were hit with COVID, and we had to expand our facility by 200 beds within a few weeks, and we didn't have enough staff. So with a simple phone call to Mayo, we rented the plane, got 100 Mayo staff to come and help us for three months. And, they, and some of them stayed with us indefinitely. So at time, you have to have that boldness to make a decision with the support of Saha and DOH, because we couldn't have made it without their support Correct. to get 100 people on the ground within two weeks to take care of our patients. Fantastic. Dr. Marwan. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, it was not easy to, uh, to be able to take such decisions with the, uh, with the uh, many things that were unknown to us uh, then, but we were blessed with Ansaha that uh, we had a good uh, uh, IT infrastructure, that uh, business intelligence infrastructure, that gave us the data that we needed to take uh, uh, timely and uh, timely decisions basically based on uh, facts, based on data. We were also uh, lucky that we had uh, plans in place to basically help us respond to such pandemics and such uh, emergencies. Uh, that proven very effective. Uh, and then the third, uh, I think, uh, as Dr. Nasser mentioned, uh, we were blessed with the uh, amount of uh, support we've been getting from the government uh, through DOH. Because uh, regardless uh, or, uh, how much uh, planning you had in place but, and uh, uh, resources thinking of having, but without the support that you, uh, we, we were getting uh, during the pandemic, we, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did uh, during the pandemics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the government definitely plays a huge role when it comes to infrastructure and mobilization. Absolutely. James, how about yourself? Yeah, I think for Mobile of Health, there were three key areas which, which really helped us. First was trust in our people. When you have the trust that you have the right people in the right place, driven by the right values, everything else feels a lot easier. So we have some fantastic people uh, and caregivers in our group. When you have those people in place, as a leadership team, you feel much happier decentralizing decision-making and command. Mm -hmm. So we were able to uh, have our teams at various levels make rapid decisions, which just made everything quicker and easier. Um, third area is information flow. So we had um, protocols put in place where information would flow up and down the line very quickly internally with various huddle mechanisms, but also as well external, um, external information flow with, uh, with key stakeholders. We were very lucky with our long-standing relationship with the Department of Health, and that information flow and real-time discussion was critical. 
uh, all for one, one for all type of mentality for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. So, <clears throat> Nura, for us, the, the very first thing that we did was to institute uh, daily huddles for the executive team. We, uh, except for the, or, or in, in addition to the EXCO, we also included our lab director, our in engineering director, and our supply chain directors, because of course those are the, the areas impacted in a, in a major way. Because during a pandemic and a crisis like that, you cannot run the business via email. You really need to talk every single day. And the beauty of it was um, that the government in both Abu Dhabi and Dubai uh, put in the same structures and they had the private sector involved in that. So we got first-hand information from government, really, really well run from the government side, and we could feed that back to our management team. And at the same time, we put in a dashboard, a daily dashboard, with four main components. The one is all the COVID numbers in all our facilities, you know, ventilated, non-ventilated, what does our capacity look like? The second thing was the impact on our staff. Uh, by categorized into doctors, nurses, admin staff, etc. How many of them were COVID positive? Where are they isolating and those kind of things? The lab results we, we had in there, how many were done, turnaround times, how many were positive? And then last but not least was the PPEs. You know, are they in time? Do we have enough stock? Do we need to move stock around? And that really assisted us to have a good feel of what's going on in the business and to be able to respond to what government also needs. It's very 360. Zaid, I'm sure you had that quite the challenge just like with Dr. Nasser in terms of opening just before the, the pandemic. So you had the challenge of opening your facility but also dealing with a pandemic. Yeah, so I think in my view, we really take it after the leadership in the country which uh, really showed you know, the trust and the confidence in the people, in the stakeholders, and in the dynamism of the health system. Um, I opened the hospital in two weeks after the pandemic was announced. I couldn't have done it without the support of the stakeholders. I didn't have the systems. I didn't have the PPEs. I didn't have the staff. But what we did do was be able to collate all the requirements to do the basic needs that the government expected us. So, you know, uh, Dr. Marwan gave us the PPEs. Uh, we got the policies from the DOH. We uh, got the staff license within record times. And uh, it really shows you that in such situations, the UAE health system is really robust. And if, in fact, I mean, as part of the government system in the past, I was even more impressed on the, the response time, on the data flow, on the preparedness of the policies, the standards that were required, and the reaction of the market. There was no differentiation between I'm a private provider or a pro public provider. We all worked as one unit, and we served just the patient, which is what it's all about. So I thought it was actually quite impressive how quickly and dynamically the health system responded, and it really goes after the leadership in terms of what they were looking for. I, th I think it was impressive. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I saw that as well. Um, and I'm, I'm still seeing that now, that I don't feel that there is this competition between public and private or the, the competition that exists within, within private as well. Um, I'd like to now address the people side of the business. Um, we saw that the impactful role that the healthcare workforce, or I'm calling it superheroes, um, placed in combating the pandemic. Um, many departmental nurses, for example, weren't used to being mobilized into the ER. Um, they weren't used to that fast-paced environment over there. So Dr. Nasser, I'm interested to know, um, how did you mobilize your workforce to take on roles that weren't necessarily the norm for them? And then what happens once the pandemic is over? Do they go back to their original roles or? Well, that's an important question. Nobody can overstate how important the workforce is. They are like the base of our strategic plan. They're the core of everything that we do every single day. So I think as a leader, I mean, I, I, had, to, I had to support and provide resources for the workforce. And the first element for, as a leader is the acknowledgement. Acknowledgement of the significant stress that they had to go through at work while having families as well as work in a stressful environment like ED with high expectations from patients, and they have to really be empathetic, right? Empathy cannot go away under stressful situation. Now, 
after that, I mean, one of the most important leadership qualities and is inspiring value by being part of the team. So I remember very vividly, we asked the nurses in the units, okay, how can we help? And they sent us a list of actions, of things that we can do. And I signed up for stocking supplies in the ICU for days. So that's what my job was. I'm no more the CEO of SSMC, I'm, I'm one of the person. So I think having those inspiring uh, things that inspire values among the organization, build the teamwork within the organization is, is very important. Now, uh, you have to connect with colleagues to help uh, drive things forward. I'm not sure, I mean, I'm probably called Marwan every single day, multiple times. I have called Dr. Jamal and DOH multiple times, because sometimes the solutions are not within SSMC, but with Saha and other healthcare organization. At times you are bold. You have to make decisions and move on forward. The, on the spot, on the spot yeah. you have to be bold. But on the long term, there are certain things that we need to be really uh, to accept. Our workforce has to be agile. They have to show empathy. We have to communicate much better with them over time. We have to have a strong strategy toward the well-being of our workforce, which is responding to their need, training them on resilience and what it takes to take care of each other and the patients. We're caring for both the staff as well as our patients, as, as well as support them in different ways. We have to have significant investment in the workforce. We, we, and let me tell you, we learn a lot about our leaders during the COVID situation, and now most of them have, have grown into bigger roles. We have to support our workforce, have a good compensation and benefit plan mm -hmm. because of the competition we have now with the West, especially with nurses and health, allied health staff. We are losing them because they have better compensation in the West. And at the end of the day, we have to create that sense of belonging to the organization that is unique as you drive the values and live with the culture that you put in place for everybody, everybody at SSMC. Despite which department it doesn't they, matter. they're in. We're all, we live in a matrix organization, so it doesn't matter who's the CEO and who is just one of the regular worker. So everybody has to pitch in, and everybody did. And an amazing thing for a new organization. Absolutely. So. Similar to Zaid. Similar to Zaid. <laughs> in fact, I met him shortly before the COVID <laughs> pandemic. As well as the fact that you were new to Abu Dhabi. Yes, and we're new to That's how I, I was introduced yeah. to him. Well, thank you so much. You know, these, uh, <coughs> these heroes dedicated themselves by often spending long hours and days and weeks exposing themselves to the virus and, and being away from their loved ones. Uh, Dr. Marwan, I'm interested in what you have to say about how you managed burnouts among your staff. Um, how did you keep people motivated? And then how do you strike that balance between safeguarding their, their mental well-being uh, as, a, as, a, as a team, but also ensuring business continuity when it comes to patient care? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we realized very early in the pandemic that uh, the, uh, those staff are uh, the, our biggest asset. So without them, we wouldn't uh, been able to do any, any of it. So we're really thankful and grateful to the efforts there and sacrifice they showed during the pandemic. Uh, and we tried to think of what uh, actually, wh how do we support them uh, to, to uh, help them continue providing uh, during the pandemic with all the stress you were mentioning. Uh, one thing is to support their uh, personal needs and family's need, uh, that being uh, having the right information, give them the reassurance they need uh, in terms of uh, PPEs, and sometimes they needed support with their families. Uh, some of them actually needed to be uh, accommodated somewhere else away from their family to, to protect their families. So th we were able to do so. That gave them the courage to come to work without being worried about their families. The other thing is we, we considered, and we th I think we, d we did, uh, we made them aware of the value and contribution that they, they, they have uh, to the, uh, the, the uh, not just the country, but the world respond to this pandemic. So being aware of the importance of your role and what value it, uh, it adds to the overall response and uh, the lives you're saving with just doing your job, give them, I think, uh, 
and the courage and the willing to to continue going uh, on and uh, taking all those sacrifices, all the the hard work. Uh, the third thing I think is uh, we need to listen to them mm -hmm. because what we might think is important to them or they need might be completely different. My, them, uh, their need might be much simpler when they what we anticipate. So it's very important to give them that uh, channel of communicating uh, to, to their leadership, to their uh, line managers, and to their colleagues across the network. Uh, so listening to each other, uh, comforting each other, sharing the information, that I think uh, it helps. Do you have any examples to share with us about what, what simple need maybe uh, we had overlooked as well? Well, well one actually group of staff, they were really concerned about uh, a colleague who was taken to the ICU. Okay. And uh, what they really had in mind is not uh, to uh, provide extra support to this colleague and make sure they get the best care or themselves. Uh, they were just worried that uh, his family might not be able to see them. So what uh, we worked with the government, uh, DOH and SEMA and so on, to bring his family from uh, home country oh. to here. And that actually gave them the pride of being part of this network, yeah. pride of being part of this uh, organization that is responding to COVID. So I think, I think uh, it's really really, it was really important to, to listen to them and uh, understand what matters to them. And, I, and I, you know, it's stories like this that make you really appreciate the, the system that we have here in the country. And, and I think that that's going to also, you know, stories like this, if we promote them a little bit more, we can also uh, attract talent from around the world to, to come in and join, join us here on Another ground. thing on the other side, actually, if I may, uh, during the uh, latest pandemic, uh, because of the importance they feel, the, the, the importance of the role they play, one physician actually who was COVID positive but they knew that they needed to uh, operate on a patient that needed that specific operation to save their lives and to uh, uh, basically about the safety. So that the whole team took the right, the right measures to uh, brought the physician, uh, the surgeon from home and asked him to operate and uh, he saved lives. Wow. So he, he really took that extra measure to, uh, to, to do so. Yeah, and I guess that's part of the oath that the doctor takes, right? <laughs> save lives. <laughs> Um, you know, the, it's, it's stories like this that also highlight the uh, different types of um, skills and expertise that we knew we had or didn't know we had, but were also um, helping us navigate future pandemics uh, more effectively. So, James, what more are you doing to uh, grow or um, attract talent considering the the competition that we all know exists to bring talent in from different parts of the world and, and keep them here? It's a great question. I think there's, there's two parts. On the growth side, a core, uh, a core function and a core purpose of Mabadala Health as well is to create a sustainable, homegrown UAE national pool of, of resource. You know, the brightest and the best doctors and nurses within the medical field, and that, that's a core component for us. We're very lucky at the moment uh, and blessed to have about 25% of our workforce to be UAE nationals. So almost 2,500 UAE nationals within our group, uh, which we're very, very proud of. As well, the, uh, the leadership of the country put in place um, a fantastic program which we utilize called the Train for Work program. This is for typically younger UAE nationals to come into various sectors, and the healthcare sector has benefited from this program. We have over 200 young UAE nationals now who are exploring different areas of healthcare and developing a passion and also sense of purpose uh, for caring for others, which is fantastic. I think the second part is attracting and retaining key talent as well. The, our CEO, uh, Hassan al Nawais, has a, an expression that he uses a lot to us as a team, which is very simple, talent attracts talent. Mm. If we put in world-class people in our respective institutions, other people see this around the world and they want to work with them. Whether it's one of our doctors in Imperial College publishing research, mentioning Abu Dhabi, they want to come to Abu Dhabi. The job for us then as, as leaders of, of our organizations is to make sure that we have high performing cultures which replicate either it's Western or Eastern or Northern or Southern, but their home country, you know, best in class environments and that's our job. I think another uh, UAE government initiative which is very valuable for us, which we support wholeheartedly, is the Golden Visa Program, which I think doesn't get talked enough enough. Um, 
for those that, that aren't aware, that's the option for expatriates to, who are talented to have a five or 10 year visa, which gives them you know, a level of security in their position in the UAE, which is incredibly important, as Dr. Mawam was saying, just to take away some of that anxiety about being away from home. Uh, so fantastic program, and we support all of our expatriate people through that if they're, if they're eligible. And it's a great form of recognition as well um, from from the nation to to expats who have given up moving, you know, from their homes to here and calling the UAE their new home. And it's amazing uh, the pride that they you see in these people when they're awarded their golden visa. Yeah. They're incredibly proud. Uh, so it's a fantastic program. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Well. Um, <clears throat> building on building on that Zaid, um, in your opinion uh, what type of skills do you believe will be needed in the region um, to help us create this future proof healthcare ecosystem look I think uh, in our in our country particularly when um, as uh, it was mentioned the workforce is quite a mix of nationals and expatriate workforce one of the most important things is being able to sustain the skill set within the country. When about 70% of the healthcare workforce is not from within the UAE, you want to really address that and carefully think about whatever policies at the top level and at the lower level you would require to sustain that skill set. So one of my views is that we need to also measure and track that skill set. Because today we have an existing skill set within the community in 10 years, depending on who stays and who goes, that skill set will change. Now, it happens in every country, but in our part of the world, in our country specifically, with the difference in ratio of the workforce, uh, it's, it's that much more elaborate. Now, being able to have a skill set to pivot in such, or, uh, such uh, situations, to be able to understand the strength and importance of communication and leadership are skill sets that we really need to adopt and need to work on further. Disaster management is something that the government has addressed for a while now, but I don't think it has trickled into the ranks from the top down. And I think there is uh, something to be said to have those disaster situations and simulations being practiced uh, at a military level, but then also on a healthcare level. We've realized the number of lives that have been lost in the pandemic are far more than certain wars. And therefore, we need to really take this into consideration so that the industry gets the focus of what skill set is required and these training and development programs that we address together with universities and with training institutes are actually uh, very fundamental in, uh, or are a very fundamental part of healthcare delivery. Uh, in most other parts of the world, most medical institutions are also training institutions or medical educational uh, institutes, the Mayo Clinic, a prime example. We need more of that and to, to be able to build that skill set, embed that skill set within the community and within the population, both the expats and the UAE nationals. And the last thing I'd like to say is that we can't only just train the UAE nationals ourselves because, yes, the, that's a core uh, component of uh, our uh, sustainability and our preparedness. But we need to be able to train the non-national workforce as well because they represent a majority at the moment. And so we can't just exclude that and we need to budget for that and be able to have that in our uh, strategies and objectives going forward. And when you're saying crisis preparedness, you mean for the medical staff, right? Because usually what we see with crisis preparedness is the, the admin, the ops, you know, the gentlemen that are sitting here uh, on the stage with me. Um, but you're talking about uh, the crisis preparedness vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the people that are actually there on the ground who are you know, providing the patient care. So, so it's beyond an, textbook. It's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that can't be simulated within a computer program or can be educated or taught mm. in a lecture hall. It's something that you almost have to do in practice. And it doesn't just focus on the health system because the health system is one component of the ecosystem. So the other elements and contributing parties that, uh, that support or not the, the healthcare system have to be adopted or integrated into that uh, training and uh, development. Crisis management has been taught, but mostly in scenarios that are not necessarily medically focused. Yes. And the pandemics were not necessarily, I think, well thought through uh, as potential, only because if you think about when the last global pandemic took place, 
was you know, many, many years or many decades ago. And therefore, that focus has not necessarily brought us uh, to think of it or consider it. I think the world will probably look at the, uh, at the healthcare sector and the pandemics and endemics in a very different lens going forward. I, I like the word endemics. I've been using that in my community very much as well. I'm, I'm very hopeful that this pandemic will end very soon. Um, but that was a very innovative uh, approach to, to the answer. So on the topic of innovation and digitalization, um, terms that we are hearing very often. Um, Hein, how do you see the impact of technology on the future role that the healthcare professionals uh, will play, considering how fast technology has been adopted in your sector so far, pre-pandemic and, and during pandemic and post-pandemic? Absolutely, Nora. I think the, the biggest lesson that we learned throughout the pandemic is how quickly people can adjust and how agile they can become when they're forced to do so. So it was wonderful that we had the leadership from the DOH side that gave us the ability to move quickly uh, when it comes to the digital kind of services. Uh, the whole industry was allowed to do telemedicine without having to go through an onerous process. Uh, so that was fantastic. They launched a couple of programs, one that was uh, very close to my heart um, that Dr. Hamid and his team launched, uh, which was called the Chronic at Risk uh, Population. So effectively, they put measures in place. They got the private sector and the public sector working together. They allocated these patients to them and they said, you have to look after them remotely. And everybody was working, putting in proper uh, group practice modules, uh, doing home-based care, doing telemedicine for this population. And subsequent to that, even a remote patient monitoring. So the technology followed. And they were supporting us every step of the way. So th that was fantastic from the, from the government's perspective. From the healthcare workforce perspective, during that exercise, one could quickly see how important it is to have physician leads. You cannot push something like this from a corporate level. You can never drive innovation and digital transformation uh, to the, all the nooks and crannies in an organization if you don't have people that pull that change uh, from the unit level. So you really need doctors who are passionate about this. We need to um, give them the opportunities to grow. We need to give them a career path so that they want to not only be in pure clinical practice but become physician leads. In other words, you need to remove the financial disincentive to go that route. We need to look at uh, academic affiliations because doctors, as soon as you have that, you attract the right kind of doctor the ones that like to learn and who like to teach. Uh, we need to look at research. It's very important for us, our research uh, programs, because very good doctors love to do research and publish papers, and that's how you grow that uh, grassroots leadership throughout the organization. It's, I think it's safe to say, though, that um, you know the research, the innovation, the digitalization, this was stuff that was already going on before the pandemic, but obviously we saw that the pandemic has had to uh, force us to accelerate um, the implementation of it. Do any of you have any examples of uh, you know, um, these tools that you quickly had to um, implement during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, one of them was the, the uh, home uh, monitoring for, pa for patients. Uh, it, it's a technology is there, but was very. Uh, it's not an easy straightforward to integrate such a system uh, to take care of patients. But we had to do it uh, through the uh, during the pandemic, because we needed to be aware of the changes that a patient might be going through while at home, especially a high uh, at risk patients, and that actually saved some lives. We were able to pick up uh, deterioration for some of the patients that we were able to bring uh, to the ED and get the uh, help in time. Wow. So I think that uh, one thing I think the whole country should be proud of. Uh, Noura, I can share with you one example. At the peak of the first surge, uh, we had to expand the facility to 520 beds right away. And we had 70 COVID ventilated patients in ICU, but we didn't have ICU staff. So we activated telemedicine, with, tele-ICU with Mayo, and we had the Mayo wow. ICU consultant round on ICU twice a day, virtually. 
to be able to keep up with the needs of our patients. And, and, and those is just, we accelerated that technology yeah. forward as everybody has mentioned, because there is value. It adds value to everything that we do. You cannot take away the human element. You cannot take it yeah. away. You have to still uh, provide the human element with technology. It will make us more efficient, more efficacious, and drive the cost down. There is no question about it. Nura, if I could add just what, um, latching on to what Dr. Marwan said, that same program, there was a wonderful example um, when we onboarded a patient. Because when you onboard the people onto this remote patient monitoring platform, you want to do it in person because you want to understand what does their home environment look like? Um, do they have the right facilities? Do they have support and those kind of things? Um, and there was this elderly gentleman, so thank God that the government did this, who was effectively living on his own in very poor conditions, really. Mm. Um, and if it wasn't for this program, which the government launched, uh, nobody would have gone for a home visit. Uh, and that gentleman would have, wouldn't have been put on the right medication because his chronic diseases were not well uh, controlled. Uh, really, uh, you know, the intervention was, was quite important to get to immediately. The only thing I would add is the Husun app. Oh, right? so <laughs> don't we love that one? <laughs> for, for the ones who love it and the many that don't. But I think the Husun app has changed our lives. We can't live without yeah. it. And although we all believe we're interested in our medical records, none of us have ever paid attention to our health status as, as much as we do today. And Al Husson has changed our lives. Gives you almost a sense of security when you see right? that green stain. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, part of our mandates in the past were, can we develop or deploy adoption of technology? People may not always want to be able to adopt technology. What, we, what the pandemic has shown us is when you force them, they'll all adopt the technology. Yeah. And Al Husson is a prime example where the future I'm not talking about the pandemic, but post-pandemic, if a Husson equivalent of a medical record is sitting on your, on your mobile phone, you can only imagine the power of what that does to personal med personalized medicine and how we can actually manage populations much better like we did, like we did in, this, uh, in this last yeah. year or two. Yeah. James, I think also in terms of uh, telemed, which you already had pre-pandemic, obviously, as one of your offerings, the, the response maybe to that or the popularity of telemed, I'm sure, shot through the roof. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, and the healthcare workers themselves also had to, uh, you know, uh, work based off of the popularity of it as well. I think that's exactly right. And a, a common theme I think you hear from everyone is it's just an acceleration of the adoption. Yep. Um, so we all, because we're in the industry, knew it was coming. We live and breathe it. But for the... For the, for the general population to really understand that they can now have a video consultation mm -hmm. with our businesses from their mobile phone is fantastic. So acceleration of adoption. I think the only other area I'd add uh, to the comments from the panelists, uh, and it's not, not really technology, but I was very proud to see uh, the UAE at the forefront of drive-through testing. You know, I, I look at the press and follow the press in other countries, especially Europe, and the volume and the ability for someone just to drive through in their car and take a PCR test is pretty basic. It has lots of logistics behind it, yeah. but we were we were ahead of many many countries globally on that front. So uh, it's pretty pretty. And fantastic. how did how did the healthcare workforce respond to that? Because that was a completely new offering for them as well to be in a public space that's not a necessarily a. a a bona fide medical space as well. How did they respond to that? I, I think it comes back to the core, the core components of, of our people again, and the right people, resilience and agility. Yep. They were able to adapt. We had uh, nurses and doctors, nurses in particular, who were very much used to a certain setting. Maybe they operate in an ICU, for example, at Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. The next day, they're at a, a, a remote location in effectively a tent, yep. you know, doing PCR testing. So the, the agility of our staff to pivot and take on different roles was, was incredible. I think that was the same across the majority of organizations. Well, we're, we're, we're very grateful, definitely, to the, to the healthcare workforce. We do have one final question before we move on to the audience Q&A. Um, and I'm going to ask this for all of you. If there's one message that you could give to tomorrow's healthcare workforce, what would it be? Okay, I will start. Yeah. I'm, I would say optimism. Okay, nice. I mean, you, I, mean, you, I mean, look what we have gone through as leaders and as healthcare professionals over the past two years. 
I mean, the human mind, with, supported by technology, is going to always find solutions. Look at how fast we develop vaccines and drugs uh, for COVID. It all boils down to the people, us working together to find solutions. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer of collaborative medicine, taking care of patients yeah. and taking care of each other. We're all we're patients and us are in the same boat. So optimism. I would say we will find solution to whatever is going to hit us next. But don't ask me to look at the crystal ball at this time. Okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it then. Uh, I think uh, it's very hard to tell them and to, uh, to do anything uh, other than the great job they've been doing over the past uh, few years. Uh, but it's very important, I think, to keep an open eye on uh, what's uh, out there and how do we, how do we bring it into medicine, uh, healthcare to make it even better, to accelerate uh, the way we, uh, to innovate the way we provide uh, services and so on. So I would, uh, I would uh, ask them to keep an open eye, always think of uh, out of the traditional ways of doing it, mm -hmm. and try to implement and uh, embrace the technology uh, to improve the healthcare. Fantastic. Okay. I think from my perspective, I think being passionate about providing care, healthcare has always been, and in my opinion, will remain a people business driven by people for people. Technology will come and technology will enhance delivery, but it, fundamentally the people need to be passionate about providing care. Very hard to follow these comments because I agree <laughs> with them. Um, I would say it's very, very important that healthcare providers realize that change is here to stay, change will accelerate, they should remain agile and, um, and embrace change you know, whilst uh, obviously keeping that personal touch when it comes to their patients. I will be a bit more biased. Oh. So I think Controversial. that <laughs> from everything I've seen over the last couple of years and basically the, UAE, the UAE's government and leadership's commitment to healthcare, my, my message would be the future of healthcare in the UAE is going to be probably one of the best in the world. The system is definitely designed and is spent on to be able to really offer highest quality care uh, anywhere the world has to offer in such a short or in a small geographic location. We've got Mayo Clinic, we've got Cleveland Clinic, we've got Saha and its facilities, now you have Reem Hospital. So we believe that with the ecosystem and the, the response and the the, the way the, the, the focus has been on healthcare in the last couple of years especially, really provides a lot of promise for what the future has in, in store for healthcare workers and healthcare professionals that want to really be part of something unique. It's really inspirational that we have so many competitors sitting beside each other, but you all are singing off the same script. That, you know, collaboration, you know, what we heard today was that collaboration is key at a time of a pandemic. Uh, borderless communication. Uh, there's no hierarchies when it comes to who's sitting on the top and who's there on the shop floor. We heard about the adoption of technology and the response from the community side as well, because you know, maybe two years ago, we wouldn't necessarily have been very responsive to Al Husun app and, and, and Bluetooth technology, contact tracing and things like that, but it offers the community a, a, you know, a certain peace of mind when it comes to their safety and their security. Um, in terms of you know, training, development, as well as attracting talent uh, to the region and specifically to the UAE, I guess I can just sum it up and say that the future of healthcare is here. The future of healthcare is here in the UAE. So this is absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, I feel like we could go on for hours and hours discussing this topic and more, but I do want to keep a little bit of room for some questions. We do have an extremely large audience here today, so I do hope that we have a question or two unless our speakers were quite comprehensive and gave you all the answers to your questions. Yes, please, yeah. Do you, or have you found with the implementation of AI technology and telehealth, any resilience from your staff or from patients? And if you have, how have you managed to overcome that? Fantastic. Who's going to take that one? <laughs> uh, 
I think uh, what's been mentioned here, I think the uh, quality of uh, staff we have uh, and uh, their also awareness of uh, the, the important value that adds to the care uh, they, they provide to patients uh, made it much easier than uh, anyone would think. So uh, we, I don't think there were any resistance to, toward technologies. Actually, there was a huge em embrace to the new technology. But again, the most importantly is to uh, communicate with them, uh, give them the right information, uh, g uh, let them uh, see the value of embracing such technology. Then you would have no issues with implementing it. I cannot agree more with Marwan because with electronic system currently you can show them what you mean by using AI. I mean, it's not like AI, AI. Well, when we implemented GI Genius, which is a, an AI technology to identify small polyps in the colon that could not be visible to the naked eye, you just have to show them what, what it means on a computer and they will say, yeah, I want to be part of it. So it's, it's about... It's all about the art of communication with the patient and connecting with the patient better than anybody else. They, they will agree with you. I feel everybody has, everybody wants to answer your question, fantastic. No, I, I think one more point to add on the, on the telemedicine side as well. For us, it's about providing optionality for patients on how they access the care. So telemedicine is just one route, for example, and if there is a, an elderly patient who's not comfortable with technology, you know, COVID regulations permitting, they still have availability to have a physical appointment or a telephone appointment as well. So I think where it's possible, optionality for access to care is critical. Yeah. Yes, uh, our example on the telemedicine side was slightly different because, you know, Mubadla and these players already had it in place. We had planned, started the planning, but we had to fast track everything when it came. So the bit about convincing your physicians to take part in the, in the telemedicine was actually made really easy because everybody understood if they didn't go for it, they wouldn't have access, their patients wouldn't have access to them. Because during that immediate period, the first couple of months, you couldn't do a physical consultation. So from that perspective, it was easy. And, but of course, the challenge then becomes over time that people migrate back to their old habits. So we had, during that period, we didn't have um, a, a telemedicine on demand because we didn't have a big command center. It was the actual doctors sitting in our facilities. So 98% of everything was booked appointments for telehealth as opposed to on demand, which was interesting. But now we're seeing it swaying back to the other side. We still have that three, 4% that is telemedicine, but we need to work on the model. And that's always the thing that's tricky, the financial model. How do you get reimbursed for your physical versus your telemedicine? And that's where some of the pushback comes, uh, you know, from the physician side. Maybe we should have the CFOs sitting on the panel as well so that we can get some more budget. Zed, do you know? Any other questions, Hello? please? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I would just like to thank everybody for, for all your... Um, very good, uh, you know, um, speeches or lectures regarding what will happen with the, here in the UAE. But I would like to reiterate only what Dr. Zaid said. We should be prepared. It's not just we have the pandemic here, we are hoping it will, it will stop. But what if another disaster comes? How prepared are we? You know, maybe the second disaster, there won't be any more electricity. Are we all prepared? How prepared are we? Definitely. You know, agriculture, the food, everything, water will be affected, you know. So each hospital should be prepared just in case there's no electricity in your hospital. How prepared are you? We I'm don't know what will happen. So I'm just opening the eyes of, of everybody. By the way, my name is... Her Excellency, Dr. Joyce. I knew Sanders. that you were a doctor from the way that you were talking. <laughs> I knew it. Thank we you have, so much. We have but time. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and, and I would like to, to thank uh, you for this one and giving the opportunity for all of us, you know, to know and to tell everybody that this is not the time to be sitting down and be calm because we have to face maybe, as he said, we should have some disaster crisis or management training. Yes. 
Yes, on the on the shop floor level. Yes. Absolutely, and right. this is very very important. Thank you. You know. Well, I'm afraid I'm I'm Thank being you. I'm being triggered that this is the end of our session, and I'm afraid that we cannot take your question uh, due to lack of time. But I'm really really grateful for all of our audiences, the physical ones and the virtual ones, which shows you the hybrid environment that we are living in today. Uh, thank you. A big round of applause for our speakers today, for your time and your insight. Um, my name is Noura al Sadraj, And again, thank you again. Uh, stay safe and stay well and sanitize. <laughs>